Hi, I'm Dave Henry. You're in my shop, in my garage, and I'm glad you're here. Today's video it concerns construction of a horizontal barrel planter made from redwood and put together with birdmouth joinery. I showed this planter briefly in a video two or three years ago, and a number of people have asked about it since. Here is the original photo of the planter, and here is what it looks like now after more than two and a half years of use. It has aged as expected for redwood, but is still strong. The wood has cracked some, but it is otherwise okay. I've put it on a stand for easier access. The planter we're building today includes a built-in high stand, but the original low stand is also included. So let's build this thing. Here is the redwood buy list as purchased. Three eight-foot one-by-six planks for the barrel and eight feet of two-by-six for the stands. Here are the basic parts for the planter and tall stand. The one-by-sixes have been cut to length for the barrel staves and milled to the final dimensions of three-quarter by five and a quarter by thirty inches. I'll provide all of these details in a subsequent chart. And uh, here the 2x6 has been cut uh, to approximate dimensions. Uh, this piece will become the two upper crossbars of the stand. The, this part will become the two lower crossbars of the stand. And these parts will become the four legs of the stand. I will describe both the short and the tall stands. I'll do the birdmouth joints next. If you are not familiar with this type of joinery, you might find my introductory video helpful. There is a link to it below the viewer window. We're using the 8 side bit, and I'm going to put a V-groove on both sides of four staves and leave the other four untouched. The bit height is set at just a shade over 3 16 inch. Okay, the eight birdmouth cuts are completed. Now let's change our bit to a three-quarter inch square and cut the grooves needed to hold the barrel ends in place. We'll cut these grooves one-quarter inch deep and one on each end of each stave, one inch from the end. And here are the eight staves ready for dry assembly with all of the routing completed. I'll do the dry assembly in three steps. First, we'll take two edge routed staves and two not edge routed staves, line them up in alternate order, and tape them together. This is very helpful in the assembly process. As you can see, I have put a framing square, clamped it to my bench top to be sure that all of these pieces are exactly square before we tape them up. Now, carefully lift up the taped assembly and stand it on end. And now we'll just do that again with the other four staves. Let's tape those final joints together. And 
now I'll band clamp it together to make it solid and to check to see uh, that all the joints are really as good as they should be. Okay, I have band clamped it as you can see and everything is tight now. Let's uh, see how those joints look. Well, they look pretty good from here anyway. And uh, when really clamped up tight in the future, they should make excellent glue joints. Next, we trace onto a piece of paper the outline of the barrel. This will give us a pattern for the ends of the barrel, which we'll be cutting out next. Our next task is making the two ends of the barrel, that is, that goes in here. As you saw earlier, the upper side of the planter is open, and the required ends will be made from the wood removed to allow for that opening. At the same time, we'll be cutting the short decorative staves that go on each end of the planter. Uh, when choosing the three staves to cut up for end pieces, uh, be sure to use one square edged, like this one, and two groove edged, like these two. This choice leaves the planter with the desired square upper edges, that is, this part. Okay, here are the short staves I've just cut off. Here are the remaining pieces of wood. Uh, these top two pieces will have to be squared off at the edges before fabricating into the end pieces. And here's the glue up for those end pieces. Here is the tracing around the barrel that we did earlier. Now we are going to draw a new octagon, one half inch inside this one, like so, to give the actual pattern for the barrel end. And here is that smaller, now correct size pattern through here. And here I've cut it out and I'm using it to trace the shape for the second end piece. Uh, there's our two ends outlined. Now we'll cut them out on the bandsaw. Next, we will dry assemble the entire barrel to see that these ends fit in the way they're supposed to. Let's put this thing together. And there it is. Um, next, we'll band clamp it to squeeze everything up uh, tightly. Let's take a look at those joints now that we got it clamped. Um, everything looks good except this one. And it's also not good at the other end. And in order to fix that, I'll have to disassemble it, take out the end pieces, and sand or plane them a bit to get the fit where it ought to be. The seams between staves look good. Okay, I have now sanded these edges of the ends off just a tad uh, off camera and dry assembled the barrel a final time to ensure that we have the tight joints we want. Be sure to mark each piece of the assembly like I've done here to be sure that you can put them back as they were in the final dry assembly fit check. Now we can move on to the glue up which will be done in two steps. In the first step We'll glue the five long staves together. Then, as a second step, all the rest of the joints. To get good access to the bird mouth joints, it helps to lift them up. The tape on the underside helps. And it is important to fully coat the joints with glue. I like Tight Bond 3 because of its longer open time, and of course, it is waterproof. Okay, let's speed this up a bit.
At this point, we're just repeating the steps shown earlier during the dry assembly. And here is the half-glued final assembly, which, uh, when taken apart, gives us the five-stave sub-assembly. Now, quickly, the final assembly steps. And at last, the fully glued up barrel. A quick editorial note. You probably noticed the poor quality of the last few clips in this video. I accidentally set my camera to low resolution uh, for two scenes, and as I'm sure most of you know by now, you don't do retakes when doing a glue up. I said several bad words. However, I don't think anything crucial was lost. Now uh, for the planter stands. I'll describe the high stand first. Using the cutoffs from the 2x6 lumber shown earlier, I put in the layout lines for the necessary cuts. We'll cut it in half to give two crossbars, and then we'll put an angle cut on both ends of each piece. The same will be true for the long uh, crossbar. The angle right here that is put on the end does not have to be exactly the 16 degrees that I call for, but it is important that each of the eight angles that you do cut is exactly the same uh, in order to give a solid, tightly fitted stand. For the legs, a long diagonal from here to here gives two tapered legs. And each leg takes two angle cuts, one on each end, like so. I will do the long cuts on the band saw and the angle cuts on the miter saw. The eight angle cuts on the crossbars are all 16 degrees, as are the four cuts on the narrow bottom ends of the legs. The angle of the cut on the wide upper end of the leg is 29 degrees. As I said before, there's a chart with all of these dimensions coming up in just a moment. And here are all of the tall stand parts ready for assembly. Before going on, you might want to remove the bandsaw marks from the outside of the legs. Okay, this is one end of that tall stand, and I've already assembled it using 3-inch stainless steel wood screws. None of the four joints in this piece have any right angles, so it will take some extra care to clamp and hold them in the correct position. If this were a fancier project, we could use fancier joinery, of course, uh, that would avoid that problem. Mortise and tenon joints come to mind, but seeing as the stand will be wet frequently and used out of doors, towed in wood screws, we're gonna, we'll put them in about like so, uh, that seems the easiest and quickest way to go. The problem that we need to solve uh, is holding these parts in exactly the right position while putting in those screws. The clamping solution that I'll show will make use of my old friend masking tape. The tape maintains the correct joint orientation while clamping the parts flat to the bench top. The assembly should start with the upper crossbar. I'm putting the screws in from the bottom of the cross pieces so they won't be visible. It's important to pay attention to the position and angle of the screws, and I use a guideline. The corner of my bench proved to be a good spot to allow firm clamping with convenient access for the drill. Here's where the screws will go in. Use of a quick grip clamp with big rubber pads on the jaws worked well to hold the work solidly while drilling. In this soft redwood, it is not necessary to drill pilot holes to the full length of the screw but a serious pilot hole is very helpful in getting it right the first time, especially when dealing with angled joints. I'm using the large diameter drill bit to make angled countersinks. After that, driving in the screws completes the first joint.
The second top crossbar joint is done like the first. Be sure that the positioning of the screws permits good drill access. The leg opposite the new joint can interfere with positioning the drill. The lower crossbar goes a bit quicker and follows the established pattern. Okay, here's what we've built so far. We're almost there. Before moving to the final assembly of the high stand planter, let's cut out the low stand parts. Only two are needed, and they are made from the same 2x6 redwood stock as the high stand. I have already laid out the cut lines. Details are provided at the end of the video with all the other planter dimensions. And here's what they look like cut out. And here is what the final planter looks like if you have chosen this short stand version. My personal preference is the taller stand because I don't have to bend over when using it. But a low planter would be preferable for many patio situations. Now, let's complete that tall planter. To attach the legs to the barrel, I turned it upside down on my bench and marked the bottom stave where I want the legs attached. There's those two guidelines if you couldn't see them before. Uh, I have chosen one and three quarter inches as the distance from the end of the barrel uh, because this allows the attachment screws to be put in from the inside of the barrel but keeps the legs near the barrel ends for stability. Leaving the barrel upside down, the leg assemblies can easily be clamped in place. And then the entire planter can be set upright on the floor. It is then easy to insert the necessary screw. I'm using two and a half inch stainless steel screws, four per end. Okay, take off the clamps and we are essentially done. Here's what it looks like. The legs are held surprisingly rigid thanks to the wraparound fit of the leg assemblies to the barrel. If you plan to drag the dirt-filled planter around the yard a lot, some additional bracing would probably help prevent the legs from getting wobbly. But I like this simpler, uncluttered look without extra and probably unnecessary added structure. The last construction step is easy but very important. Drill a few 3 8 inch drainage holes in the bottom. Your plants will appreciate it. And finally, here's the planter in a couple of garden environments. Well, that's it for the horizontal barrel planter. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.